I'm always asking the question as as a as a farmer. I'm always asking the question: What's going to come the earliest, and what's going to come the latest? You know, when can I be in the market when somebody else isn't in the market? Um, you you have your physical graffitis and your American Beauties, and they're great and they're wonderful, and everybody and their mom grows them. Um, and so you could have the best fruit in the world, but if everybody has the best fruit in the world, at their it's home worth nothing. Yeah. And it, and not just the home growers, because you're you're never going to have all the people that want it grow it at home, yes. right? There's enough people that aren't going to do that. But if your farm and your sister's farm and some big grower in Southern California's farm are all bringing your fruit off at the exact same time, it's supply and demand, immediately the same amount of fruit of the same quality is worth a ton less just yeah. because there's not enough demand for all that fruit. Now, uh, and that's probably a big problem with commercial dragon fruit is that we have this huge mega bloom and we have all this fruit ripe at the same time. Well, and since all your growers are in the same area, mm -hmm. they all have the same mega bloom the one year and they all have the same retarded uh, bloom the other year. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, when nobody has fruit, it's expensive. And when everybody has fruit, it's cheap. And so if you don't have much fruit, but it's more expensive, there's a benefit to that um, in that you get to make a little bit of money off that. But you're maybe not making any more money than if you had a bunch of fruit that was cheaper. Yeah. Um, and maybe you're making a lot less because you don't have much fruit. So I want to I, I, I'm keeping an eye towards diversifying so that if I've got one variety that's not good this year, maybe another one is. Mm -hmm. But I also want to be. A little bit you know is there something different about my climate is there something different about my area or do I need to look at a different variety than other people so that I can supplement the holes that exist in today's market mm -hmm. so you want to um, fill the gaps when there's a big, great demand for dragon fruit you want to have that supply yeah on an off season or off time compared yeah to other parts but in addition to that I actually I also want to see I want to see all farmers be successful to mm -hmm. me I look at somebody who's willing to pour their life into farming. That's a special breed of person. I, and this is maybe different than other people, I really like to eat food. I I enjoy having nutrition in my body that I can eat that makes me grow and be healthy. And yeah. I know maybe everybody doesn't feel that way, but I feel I hope most that do. way a lot. <laughs> yeah. So to me, there's a special place in my heart for farmers. So I want to see people willing to do that hard work be successful. So I think there's some space in the dragon fruit industry for growers to work with each other as opposed to working against so each other. So more of a co-op instead of a competition. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and the, the bottom line is there's nowhere near enough dragon fruit for the potential market for the dragon fruit right now. Mm -hmm. But if as a set of growers we communicate to the market, when I have this stuff, I'm going to dump it, then everybody who buys dragon fruit is only going to buy it when you're dumping it. Yep. And nobody's going to care about the process that goes into making this stuff good. You know, you could have that you could have dragon fruit for 99 cents a pound and you could have dragon fruit for $8 a pound and just the experience I've had of eating different dragon fruit, I know for a fact there's things I would pay $8 a pound for yeah. and there's things I wouldn't even pay the 99 cents yes, for. Yes, I agree. And so I think as dragon fruit farmers, we have a responsibility to ourselves, we have a responsibility to the consumers and we have a responsibility to each other to both keep our quality up and keep a, and give consumers a way to identify that quality, whether that's a California grown mm -hmm. brand or co-op or something like that, um, whether that's a federal marketing order that gives us uh, an opportunity to sort of uh, supply a certain amount each year as a commodity mm -hmm. uh, with a certain standard, right? Um, there's a California standard for citrus and you don't get to export citrus to other countries and label it as California citrus unless it meets a certain standard. So there is and a that's a ratio of bricks to acid. Okay. And so if you can if you can create a bar that's required for branding, right? So you, you have a marketing order and that creates a bar required for branding, you may grow two hundred you know, you may have two hundred thousand pounds or you know twenty tons of fruit on the market today. But if it doesn't meet that bricks to acid ratio, you can't brand that as California mm -hmm. fruit because California fruit means something. Yeah. And so I think California dragon fruit should mean something. So you're, you think the biggest problem is that California lacks a standard for dragon fruit where we can have raise the bar. And also that would also uh, affect the standard of imported dragon fruit, too. 
I don't know if I would say biggest problem. Okay. Um, I would say it's one potential solution to a big problem. Big pro- okay. A big problem is consumers don't know what they're going to get when they buy a piece of dragon fruit. They don't know where it's from. They don't know why they should care where it's from. They don't know what what type of dragon fruit is good. Yeah, I mean, I think know they have like red skinned or red flesh when it says right, red, right? red, white, purple, mm-hmm. or 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 red, purple, and that's it. And then you know, people call reds purple, and then people talk about magenta, and and all that stuff is a bit too much for the consumer. What the consumer wants to know is, what do I need to, where do I need to go, and what do I need to look for to know that the piece of fruit is good? Yeah. So it's like Consistent. a quality assurance. Yeah. Yeah. So it's and it is it's. It really, it, it's not quality assurance in, in terms of like the guy who's putting the stickers on things, <laughs> yeah. right? It's an actual assurance. If I'm going to spend $8 a pound on a piece of fruit, or if I'm going to spend $5 a pound on a piece of fruit, or if I'm going to spend $20 a pound on a piece of fruit, I want to know that that's worth the dollars that I pay. Mm-hmm. And it is essential as dragon fruit growers, which, you know, I'm experimenting, but I'd like to, to count myself in that number eventually, if not very soon i think you're, there, um, <laughs> you're a grower <laughs> what what i want to know is that i have a customer who knows what they're going to get when they buy from me yeah um and, and it's it's it cannot i couldn't possibly overstate the importance of it i, I could try but i wouldn't get there so i think like i want to sit here and like look at look at scott over here and challenge like the crew and just be like hey guys like we need to care about our quality and we have to find a way to communicate that and differentiate ourselves because California has always had the best world climate for growing fruit. We have the best of everything. Mm-hmm. We've got great sunshine. We can harvest more sunshine than anybody else. We have great weather. We have the longest growing seasons out of anywhere. Well, I mean, they could have slightly longer at, a, at the equator, but yeah. they also have that high humidity that causes problems, mm-hmm. right? We've got that dry heat. And more pathogens so, they have, too. And they have more pathogens. And and I've even noticed in here, like we were talking about earlier, I get my humidity up too high for a short amount of time and diseases start going crazy. So we have that dry that we can use to control our own humidity, yep. either through misters or for dripping. We have so many advantages over other areas that grow this fruit. No, we have some disadvantages too. It's not it's not cheap to get yeah. labor in California, you know? So that's something we're gonna have to overcome. Mm-hmm. So some of the cold snaps we get could Some of the cold change. snaps we get could affect it. So we have to have frost mitigation. But you know, as a as an old hat su- uh, suma, sorry, citrus mm-hmm. farmer in general, we've been through cold snaps. We've survived them. We yeah. we have a lot of strategies. There's ice encapsulation, you get the ground wet and it radiates heat. Um, we have wind machines on every plot that we've got anywhere. Um, and then we also, um, we'll also just get the foliar, you, you get the, the vegetation wet as well. Mm-hmm. And what will happen is as ice forms, it'll suck. It sucks. Uh, it basically, um, releases heat off into the plant as the ice forms because it uh, sucks the cold in the cold effect, in. you know, it's sucking yeah. the cold out of the plant and putting it into the ice. Like capsule. And then once it's encapsulated, it can't get colder than 32 degrees. So if your plant can handle 32 degrees for a fi- for a period of time, once it's encapsulated in ice, everything that's covered by the ice can't get colder than that. It's just we're, not possible. Even what we're in right now, it's never yeah. going to get 30 below freezing in this situation, well, right? Yeah, I mean this we get we get even in the coldest times of year we're getting 10 to 12 degrees of passive heat from this. Okay. And then you could add a heater to it if you really needed to. Now, I don't think all my plantings will be this fancy. This yeah. was an experiment that was going a different direction that was unsuccessful. Again, you know, that's why they call it research, right? Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't always work out how you wanted it to work out. But you're repurposing this. For, but yeah, no, but right? that's another advantage of being flexible um, is I, I've, you know, you know, not only do I have this beautiful area where I can grow through the winter and get, you know, half a year ahead of where I would be, yep. but it's also an opportunity. Um, I was able to reuse a lot of my infrastructure in here. So this trellis, um, I wouldn't talk a lot about this trellis because this is just our get us through this experiment pilot, right? trellis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we, you know, because of our citrus program, we have a lot of experience with trellises as well. Mm-hmm. And my dad's worked with table grapes a lot as well. And I can see you guys using a, a creating a new trellis. But I mean, yeah. just the the discussion we had about trellising citrus is is mind blowing about the production you can get. So imagine what you guys could do with just maybe improving a trellis design. Well, yeah, and then you know maybe. Maybe we need a multiple tiered system because I, I've noticed, man, I just got 
I got a voracious appetite for dragon fruit knowledge <laughs> and I just, you know, just eating it up and I'm watching all these videos and that's how we met. Yep. I think I, I, I just cold called this guy. I was like, Hey, if I pay you money, will you tell me about dragon fruit? And this guy's like, nah, I, I won't do that, but I'll tell you about dragon fruit anyways. <laughs> Yeah, I refuse to. Weirdo who hates me. I just want to know what's going on with that. I just want to, I love dragon fruit. That's it. (laughs)